Well, Happy New Year. One of my big plans this year is to do some recording, so we're going to talk about that and more, so stick around. Welcome to Charlie's Open Mic. My name is Charlie Mossbrook. This week we're going to talk to John McGrail. He's a singer-songwriter out of Cleveland, Ohio. He's been doing a lot of recording and working remotely with his engineer. We're going to talk to him about that and more, but first we're going to listen to his music. Welcome to the show, John McGrail. Hey, how you doing? I'm well. I'm well, good to see you. Um, I've known you for a real long time, uh, being in Cleveland probably over 30 years now. Uh, but you came from Michigan originally. Where in Michigan yeah. were you from? Um, I'll do what your, not your last guest, your previous one did. West Branch. <laughs> West Branch, okay. Yeah, it's, it's uh, about three hours north of Detroit, population 2,000, biggest city in the county. Um, it's out in the middle of nowhere, basically. But, uh, and what brought you to Ohio? Um, I went to the University of Michigan my freshman year, and I wanted to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And I actually applied to Michigan State, and I applied to John Carroll because they uh, actually waived the application fee if I'd consider going out for their basketball team. So I applied there just because it was free. And uh, Michigan State never got back to me, and John Carroll rejected me. I didn't do really did my freshman year <laughs> but uh it's a jesuit school and my uncle was at the time the president of the university of detroit which is also a jesuit school and so he contacted whoever and and they accepted me on condition that you know i was on probation and stuff like that and then once i went there i you know, i did fine 
but uh, I'd gotten the hang of just how much you have to study and stuff to get good grades. And did you ever did. play basketball? Oh yeah, I played four years in high school. So, yeah. Um, no, but did you did you play at John Carroll? I went, <laughs> this is kind of funny. I had worked out the whole summer going before going to get in shape and stuff, and when basketball season came around, I, w- I went to the first practice. The coach is like, okay, I want you to do 100 uh, jump ropes and then run down to such and such park, which I had no idea where it was. And I'm just looking around thinking, my head isn't here anymore. <laughs> so I just went in, I wrapped the jump rope around his office door, and I went back to my my office or my dorm room and picked up my guitar and played. At that point, music was more important than sports. When did you start playing music? Just as I was leaving high school, like my last year in high school or so. I was probably 17 or so. I used to listen a lot to Cat Stevens. I can't remember what song, The Road to Find Out. It was just a lot of strumming. I thought, that seems pretty easy. I could probably do that. And then a girl I was dating in high school got a old red Sears guitar from a friend of hers and and gave it to me. But I used that for first couple years and then my parents got me a, a better guitar. And when they realized I was I was hooked, I used that for quite a while, and then I, I finally got this thing, this Alvarez from the old Goose Acres when it was down up, used to be in an old firehouse up by Euclid, and I've been using that one as my main guitar in the house. Um, I've got a Wector that I use for uh, playing live because it's wired up better. This thing feeds back like crazy. I, I was playing with a band out of the Rap Art Center. That band evolved into another band. And uh, finally, they wanted to become a cover band, so I was like, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm quitting. And at that point, I was just pumping gas, and I might have been delivering flowers, and that was my existence. So I thought, you know, I need to learn how to play solo. So I started working on my finger picking and, and, and just playing songs and you know, occasionally going to an open mic and stuff like that. So how did you develop your style? You're, 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 um, the way I think of your songwriting is sort of beautiful, haunting... And, I mean, you hear it in Jerusalem. I mean, some of my influences are like Pink Floyd, um, Cat Stevens. More on the rock side, I used to really be into U2 for a while. Dylan came later. Um, okay. I mean, it was a lot later, actually. I mean, he, I'd been playing solo for a while, and I thought, I need to start listening to Dylan, because <laughs> there's something there. Well, like, in high school, we would, my brother liked Dylan. And as I became an adult, if I am one, um, you know, I started listening to him also combination of the influences I, I, I have. Um, I think Floyd was big. I'm also always amazed at your guitar technique. Um, I was thinking about this a little earlier, thinking about Tony Rice passing. Yeah, and, that's stupid. Um, and how articulate and it almost seemed effortless the way he played, yet everything was very pronounced and everything was very clear. There was no... Yeah. You know, just, and, and, and I think of your playing as uh, being very similar in that fashion. I used to listen to a lot of, like, John McLaughlin, and I still do, actually, Nal Demiolo and people like that. Um, and I always had an, uh, an attraction to, like, Spanish music. Um, even, even, like, some of Cat Stevens' stuff, you'll find, like, little Spanish licks and stuff in his arrangements. Starting on the acoustic guitar, when I would go to play a lead or something, that just seemed natural to, to, to lean towards a, a more Spanish flamenco influence. You know, then I got a, an electric guitar and plugged a distortion box in, and it was, you know, a totally different world. And it's bending and screaming. And, uh, McLaughlin's always been a big, big acoustic player, in addition to being electric. And, and he always had a nice tone, and Demiol had a nice tone mm-hmm. uh, on his stuff. So I, it, there was a period where I was really into jazz, like jazz rock and stuff, and, and that, that probably cemented my st- lead style more than anything else. It was years, years later, I decided I need to learn to finger pick more because I'm going to be playing solo. I need to make more sound with just one instrument. I sh- kind of shifted my focus for a long time. Now, now that I finally got a, a band together, we could, can't play anymore because of COVID, but, uh, but that, that playing with Carl and Jay has always been a lot of fun. So tell me about this new band. Carl Holt, who used to play drums with Jay's band the kind mm-hmm. and then jay plays bass and then it's me on guitar and voice so jay does some backing vocals and stuff. actually i'm working on some recordings we did and later i'm going to be sending some of the songs over to jay to, and we'll mix them on zoom you're going to mix them on zoom so are you just are you going to be monitoring jay then in a zoom window and he'll 
<laughs> we can't jam on Zoom because of the latency, but right. uh, but he sets his his phone up so it's viewing the recording screen. Um, so you got all the, the lanes and stuff, and uh, and then I, I use a set of headphones instead of speakers to to listen to it back. You know, ultimately he then sends me a file and I listen to it here at home on my stereo and make sure it sounds because it's a little funky because um, mm -hmm. I can't totally see the screen. So sometimes he'll be working on something, but I don't know if he's working on the the bass lane or the the guitar lane or you know like that and uh like one time he was working on one thing but but i'm talking about something else but because i can't read the the, the fine print on the the recording screen it's like wait a minute no no we're working on the wrong thing stop and so we back up and get it straight but uh but it works i mean it, it, it's a little more frustrating it's a little more fatiguing the only advantage is when i'm done i'm home <laughs> you know i don't have to, to drive another 40 minutes from jay's place but uh I'd rather be in the room, though. I mean, that, that's oh, sure. it's just easier to communicate and see what you're doing and stuff. But this is the option, so this is what, what I do. But I, I do use a lot of the MIDI stuff. I've got a, a orchestral program that I really dig. It allows me to, to write in a way that I always wanted to, but just didn't have... I mean, I can't write score music. I, I can't write music out on paper. And uh, this way I can just sort of play the parts, listen to it, move notes around, and make everything as exact as I want. And it gives it an orchestral feel. I mean, it, it, it's more useful with my Headwiz stuff, which is more experimental. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my imaginary band. I don't know if you looked at that at all. But, uh, the imaginary band? Yeah, it's uh, called the Headwiz Concert Modern International. And it's supposedly ten players from nine countries around the world. It's all me, but... Uh, Oh. But I figured to avoid getting me confused with them, I created this. And if you go to my website, there's a section called The Lives of the Headwoods Concert where I write stories about them interacting <laughs> in their lives. And I'm, I'm in there, too. There's a couple called Travels with Babacar, who's the head of the concert. Where Tim and E traveling. I, I took a trip to the Badlands, and I took the trip down to the Gulf Shore of Alabama once. And uh, I call it biofiction. It's a combination of what I actually did, but then I plugged Babacar into the passenger seat and, you know, we, we things happen that didn't really happen. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just fun. I'm just goofing around. I'm not trying to fool people into thinking that there's really this band, but, uh, but it's a way to sort of keep the two ideas separate. Because I record here and it's, it doesn't cost me anything. I don't get as wound up as if I was going into a studio where I was paying somebody. Um, I couldn't do as much as I do if it was costing me money to, to do it. You know, I just get up every day and work in the studio and, you know, and break for dinner and maybe go back into the studio. But, uh, but if I had to pay somebody, it's, I, I still go to Jay's to mix, mm -hmm. but the actual recordings I do here, um, just cause I can do it at my leisure. Now, why do, why do you do that? Is it just that Jay's that good at it? Or do you just like having a separate set of ears that you trust? I like the, se the second set of ears. Um, his studio has more stuff. It's more laid out. He's got more plugins and, and effects and things like that. And he's good. I mean, he, he, mm -hmm. I just... If I had to mix by myself, I would. But I, he's worth paying to, to ha have his hand in on it. He used to do a thing at, at the Barking Spider. Uh, the Mind Fry Person of the Year Award. The Mind Fry Person of the Year yeah. Award. Yeah, I've got the trophy in the other room. We, we quit giving it out when the spider closed because I just can't imagine any other place putting up with that kind of behavior. Um. <laughs> Whoever won it got to add something to the trophy. So it's a conglomeration of things. Like the, the, I don't know if you know Chaz Patterson. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, he was the one who actually designed the, the trophy originally. And so he came up with the brain and the frying pan. And, uh, you know, other people, like my friend Dan McCafferty, he won it one year, and he was a big... He had a lot of snakes. So he had a, there's a snake skin around it. Um, Jenna won it towards the end, and there was this guy, like this figure, and he had to have a, a Guinness cap on his hand. But he would always break on the way to the show. So finally, when Jenna won it, she turned the guy into a bungee jumper and got this long spring attached to his feet. 
<laughs> which I thought was like the greatest solution for that problem. I always got a little like plaque to put the person's name on when they won. I would keep track of who attended shows and things like that over the course of the year. So at the like the, at the end of 2020, I would know who had come to shows and bought CDs and things like that. And whoever accumulated the most point was the, the, the winner. My friend Dave, we had to put him on the, the, in the gallery of the insane because he was winning like almost every year because he would always go to the shows and stuff. So it's like, sorry, Dave. <laughs> I appreciate your, your support, but <laughs> you've won too many times. You can no longer win it. Um, given it was Mind Fry Enterprises Person of the Year Award, I called it the Gallery of the Insane. <laughs> At the beginning of a new year, it seems customary to start making plans, to make goals, resolutions, to think about where we want to go and where we see ourselves. 2021, there's still so much uncertainty. The pandemic is still upon us. Uh, where do we want to go and what do we want to do? I really can't start planning. One thing I can do is think about things I can do at home, and one of those things is recording. Uh, I plan to do a lot of recording and hopefully to put out a new record. I'm writing a lot of new music, which is exciting to me because I don't write well in the middle of the storm. So that's telling me, or at least I'm hopeful, that this storm is lifting, that maybe there is an end to this pandemic, that things will start to become calm again. And I'm hoping that that's where we're going. With that, I'm looking forward to recording a new record. I like to work with others. I like to bring other musicians in to add to what I'm doing. That's part of what makes this show magical to me, is that other people are involved. How am I going to do that in the middle of the pandemic? I don't know. I think we're going to try to do some remote recording where I'm working with other musicians. And that's going to put me in a place where I really need to trust the musicians I'm working with, that they're going to bring something that I'm going to love. Trust is an important part of playing music with others and collaborating. Trust is an important part of life. So I think something I really want to work on in 2021 is trust. Happy New Year. May we never forget where we have May we never forget the feeling within May we hold tightly to memories How we had to climb up from our knees And the scars won't save us They really don't care No, our scars won't save us They really don't care Outside my father's door in a canopy scene And the late autumn cool and the shaking of the leaves Opens up the door to a deep winter freeze And the winds won't save us, they really don't care No, the winds won't save us, they really don't care Are we exposed and don't even know it? And button your coat is gonna be a long, cold winter, my There is no guarantee what was will still be And the past has seen its share of broken treaties And an empty promise, deliberate deceit Be careful who you bow to when you're at their feet Cause a promise won't save us, they really don't 
Though a promise won't save us, they really don't care. Now, thanks for watching Charlie's Open Mic this week, and thank you to John McGrail for sitting down and talking to me about recording and sharing his music. As always, please hit that subscription link down below. Please ring the bell for notifications of upcoming episodes. And you can always visit us at charliesopenmic.com where you can find our Patreon link to help support the show. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>